Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel, long time no see since yesterday. If you've already seen part one, today we're gonna be doing part two of the Bain family murders. So if you haven't seen part one, I will put the link in the description box down below. Otherwise, it's just the video I posted yesterday, the last video on my channel before this one. And if you haven't seen it, it just gives a lot of background to the case and the Bain family. We ended that video with the eldest child of the Bain family, David Bain, having been arrested for the murders of his entire family. And his trial started on the 8th of May in 1995. So the trial took place at Dunedin High Court and there were 60 witnesses that were called to the stand to testify about, you know, obviously to try and uncover what had happened on the morning of the 20th of June in 1994, which is of course the day that the murders took place. David also testified in his own defense and every time that he would get up and take the stand, he was wearing these colorful sweaters that his mother Margaret had knit while she was still alive. He testified that he loved his family, that everyone was super close and that he respected and loved his father Robin, which is obviously such a different picture to what everyone knew the family to be like. You know, they were known to be super dysfunctional and divided. There were two sides to the family, those who were on their mother Margaret's side and those who were on their father Robin's side. The defense also tried to argue that obviously it was possible that Robin was actually the murderer. And while the prosecution agreed that he was the only other potential killer they went on to give many reasons as to why it was unlikely that Robin was responsible. First of all, there was no trace of blood on his socks or his shoes. And as we know, the killer left a trail of bloody sock prints throughout their family home. None of Robin's fingerprints were found on the rifle, nor was there any gunpowder found on his hands. And how would he have murdered his entire family and himself without getting any fingerprints on the gun? It was also super unlikely that Robin was able to shoot himself from the angle he was shot from with a rifle. Not to mention Robin was right-handed and he was shot on the left-hand side of his head. So it's just super unlikely that he was able to do that himself. The prosecution also provided a timeline of how they believe the murders took place. So they alleged that David woke up at 5 a.m. on the 20th of June and got dressed for the day. He put on his theater gloves and then he grabbed his 22 caliber Winchester semi-automatic rifle from the wardrobe in his room. He he unlocked the trigger lock with a spare key that he kept in a jar on his desk. And then he made his way through the house, slaughtering his mother and his siblings one by one. It's believed that 14 year old Stephen did put up a fight. And during the struggle, one of the lenses from David's glasses fell out onto the floor of Stephen's bedroom. Due to the struggle, David also strangled Stephen with a t-shirt before shooting him in the head, which is obviously different to the murders of the rest of his family because there was no strangulation, they were just shot point blank. After David had finished murdering his mother and his siblings, he then noticed there was blood on his clothes. So he went downstairs to the laundry, got undressed, put the clothes in the washing machine, and then he went and had a shower and went out on his newspaper delivery route. So he left the house for this at 5.45 a.m. He was out for about an hour and he got home at 6.42 a.m. They allege he then turned the living room computer on at 6 44 a.m. and wrote the suicide apology note. He then went and hid in a curtain or behind a curtain in the living room and waited for his father Robin to come inside because obviously Robin was staying in the caravan and he normally came from the caravan into the main house at 7 a.m. every single day to do his morning prayer. So the prosecution alleges that while he was praying that's when David came and shot him with the rifle at close range. He then staged the scene and you know put the rifle next to him the magazines that sort of thing and then he called emergency services at 7:09 a.m. The prosecution also alleges that his motivation behind the murders was financial that he was aware that his parents had a decent amount of money and he wanted it I guess. Something the prosecution also focused on in their arguments was the fact that David claimed he heard Laniette gurgling and making gurgling sounds and they basically said that if he heard Laniette gurgling then he must have been there right after the murders, like pretty much immediately after. And if he heard her gurgling and it meant that she was barely clinging to life, but she was still alive, then why didn't he try to help her? Why did he run out of the house first instead of immediately calling emergency services to try and save his sister? The Crown Prosecution ended their arguments by saying only one person could have heard Laniette gurgling and that person was the murderer. 
Following the trial, the jury deliberated for nine hours and when they returned, they found David Bain guilty on five counts of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of 16 years. But the case does not end there. This case was huge, like probably one of New Zealand's biggest cases. It had a huge amount of media attention, so much so that former All Blacks rugby player Joe Karam, who is now a lawyer, actually started a campaign to have David's conviction overturned, saying he believed it was one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in New Zealand's history. There was actually a massive public divide on whether or not David was guilty and whether or not it was David or Robin who actually committed the massacre. There was obviously numerous reasons for this, but one main crazy revelation came out towards the end of David's trial, except this information wasn't presented in court to the jury. And if it was presented in court, it probably would have impacted the jury's decision. So basically there was this guy named Dean Cottle and he came forward to police he knew Laniette and they had kind of a complicated connection. There's a lot of different stories out there about how they know each other. Some people literally call him her pimp and then other people say that he was more of a friend who paid for Laniette's stuff like her phone and other things in exchange for sex. Like her phone was literally registered under his name. So he knew Laniette well enough. So he comes forward and he says that Laniette told him that her father Robin had been sexually abusing and raping her throughout her entire childhood and that she actually became pregnant while in Papua New Guinea and had to get an abortion which is insane because Laniette was born in Papua New Guinea and they moved back to New Zealand when she was like 12 years old so she had to have fallen pregnant to her father's child when she was 12 or younger and Robin was a teacher at this time as well which just adds a whole other layer to this. So Laniette apparently also told Dean that she was done with her family, that she had gotten a job at a cafe and she wanted to start a new life without her family in it, basically. Now, because police learned of this information while David's trial was still ongoing, obviously they wanted Dean to testify to this information during the trial, but he actually ignored his subpoena and I think he like fled the country, like he flew to Brisbane instead of answering to his subpoena and coming to testify at the trial. So of course he was considered an unreliable witness. The testimony was considered unreliable. The judge also said it was just hearsay anyway. And so this information was thrown out of the case and it was never heard in trial. But then a month after David's trial ended, Dean actually signed an affidavit, which basically said that Laniette had told him that she was going back to her family home the night before the murders occurred to tell them all about her father's abuse. After this information became public, a bunch of other witnesses also came forward to corroborate Dean's story and said that Laniette had also mentioned the same thing to them. Apparently she had confided in both friends and strangers as well. Her friend came forward to say that she had confided in them to say that she had gotten a new job at a cafe. This was like right before before the murders occurred, right? So she had gotten a job at a cafe and she was going to stop doing sex work and she was planning on going home on that Sunday night to tell her parents that she had worked as a sex worker and also to tell them about her incestuous relationship with her father. She even told a local dairy farmer from near her flat that she lived at by herself, you know, after she had moved out from her family's place. She told this local dairy farmer that she had also been having an affair with her father, which I just wanna add as well that while her friend and the farmer both said that Laniette implied this was a relationship and an affair, it wasn't. And Dean Cottle understood this as well. It wasn't an affair, it wasn't a relationship, it was sexual abuse and it was rape. And a whole nother layer to this as well is the fact that, you know, as we spoke about in part one, Laniette often defended her dad. It's why she had such a tumultuous relationship with her mother because she was always defending her dad, always on her dad's side. She went and stayed with her dad a bunch in Tairi and her dad also paid for her rent when she moved out and they just seemed to speak all the time and they were really close. So if these claims of abuse are true, it seems like Robin must have manipulated her to a point where maybe she 
actually believed it was a relationship and it was an affair. And it's possible that when she was talking about going to tell her family about her father, maybe it wasn't in an attempt to expose him and expose his abuse, but an attempt to try and be open about their relationship because he had manipulated her to a point where she believed it was a relationship. The thing is though, neither Laniette or Robin are alive to corroborate any of this or to straighten any of this information out. So we're never gonna know the truth. One thing I will say is that the witnesses that came forward to say that she was planning on telling her parents, it didn't seem like she was trying to be open about a relationship. You know, it seemed like she knew that it was a bad thing, that she was done with her family, but we're just never gonna know. We're never gonna know the full extent of what happened, what sort of abuse there was, if there was any abuse, what Robin and Laniette's true relationship was like. Also, despite these witnesses that came forward to say that Laniette had called the meeting on Sunday to tell her family about her father, three separate witnesses, so a friend and neighbor of Laniette's, a friend from Tairi and also an aunt of the Baines came forward to say that David was actually the one who called the family meeting, not Laniette. And a former teacher of Laniette also came forward to say that she had seen Laniette on the Sunday and that she seemed really agitated, she seemed nervous, and that she was going home for a meeting that night and that she was scared of her brother David. So since David's conviction, he has made numerous attempts to appeal the conviction. The first appeal attempt was in 1995 and the basis for this appeal was basically that they believed the judge had made a mistake in not allowing Dean Cottle's testimony in the trial. The court however refused to hear the appeal and they agreed that Dean's testimony was clearly inadmissible. In June of 1998 David petitioned the Governor General for a pardon and this was passed on to the Ministry of Justice. The Justice Minister said there did appear to be a bunch of mistakes in the investigation and asked the Governor General to to seek a new opinion from the Court of Appeals. He also said that, quote, the case against him seemed to be entirely circumstantial. In response to this, the Police Complaints Authority went and reviewed the investigation and they released a 123 page report, basically supporting the conduct of the investigation. The appeal took place anyway, and in December of 2002, they concluded that it is possible that a miscarriage of justice may have occurred in this case, and they requested a full reconsideration. This reconsideration happened almost a year later and they dismissed the appeal. Now normally in New Zealand David would have to apply to the Supreme Court next because that's kind of like the highest court of appeals once you've exhausted all of your other appeal efforts. However because David was sentenced before 2004 he actually had to apply an appeal to the Privy Council in Britain because that was like the highest court of appeals for British territories before 2004 and interestingly enough David Bain's case was actually the last New Zealand case that the Privy Council ever heard. Anyway, in March 2007, the Privy Council began considering David's case and David's defense, which included Joe Karam, put together nine points of contention with the goal of showing reasonable doubt. And these nine points of contention were vital pieces of evidence that weren't presented in David's original 1995 trial. There was also a 46 page document which outlined the wrongdoings of the first trial, but let's go through these nine points of contention. So the first point was that Robin Bain's mental state in the lead up to the murders was never explored or presented to the jury and instead he was depicted incorrectly. He was said to be this dedicated teacher, parent and this devout Christian when this was actually far from the truth. Kevin McKenzie, who was the president of the Tairi Principals Association, said that he had a very different impression of Robin. He said that he visited the school that Robin worked at in Tairi after the murders and that Robin's office was in disarray. Like it was totally disorganized. It was messy. It was dirty. There were a ton of unopened letters everywhere. He also said that he found this newsletter that had been sent out to all of the kids' families. And in this newsletter were all of these stories from Robin's kids, like his students. And these stories all had this common theme of violent, brutal, serial murders of 
family members. And Kevin said that it was unlikely that the kids conceptualize these stories on their own, especially because it was like a reoccurring theme. It wasn't just like one kid wrote a story about this. It was like multiple kids wrote a story about this same sort of serial family murder theme. So he obviously believed that the kids were instructed to write these stories. Another psychologist did say that it's possible that they were based off like a movie they watched in class or something. I mean, first of all, they sh probably shouldn't have been watching anything like that in class. And the fact of the matter is Robin put these, he made the decision to put these graphic violent stories in a newsletter, which was then sent out to all of these kids' families. Kevin also believed that these stories served as, quote, the clearest possible evidence that Robin Bain had lost touch with reality due to his mental state. Cyril Wilden was a teacher and psychologist who also visited Robin prior to the murders taking place. And he said that Robin had become disorganized to a point where he believed that Robin was clinically depressed. So the second point of contention was the lack of motive for David to have murdered his entire family. Originally, they said that the motive was potentially financial, but they believed that this motive would not have been so apparent had the court of the initial trial heard about Laniette's abuse at the hand of her father. Multiple witnesses corroborated the incestuous abuse that Laniette suffered, and one witness even stated that Laniette said to them, I can't stand what he's doing to me any longer. Laniette knew the whole family would be together on that Sunday night. So whether it was her or David that called the meeting, she saw it as an opportunity to tell her family about what her father was doing to her. The Privy Council said, quote, if the jury found Robin to be already in a state of deep depression and now a school principal and ex-missionary facing the public revelations of very serious sex offenses against his teenage daughter, they might reasonably conclude that this could have driven him to commit these acts of horrific and uncharacteristic violence. The jury might not extravagantly have felt that this evidence put a new complexion on the case. The third point of contention were the bloody footprints that were discovered. As we know, the bloody footprints were made by the right foot of someone wearing socks. And there were a few footprints found in Margaret's room, which then trailed into Laniette's room. And these footprints were believed to have belonged to David as he had been wearing socks that morning. The issue the defense had with the footprints belonging to David is that the footprints measured in at 280 millimeters long, but David's footprint measured in at 300 millimeters long, while Robin's footprint was 270 millimeters. The tests show that typically a bloody sock print would be slightly larger than the foot that made it, meaning it couldn't have been made by David as his footprints in a bloody sock would be closer to 310 millimeters rather than 280 millimeters. So if the defense could prove that the footprints were Robin's, that he changed his clothes before ending his own life, it would explain the lack of blood on him when he was found in the living room. And it would also mean that he placed the bloodied clothes in the laundry basket and David just unknowingly put them in the washing machine when he came home. So that could explain how blood got on his hand and how blood got on the laundry detergent box. So the footprints are obviously a huge, like crucial part of evidence in this case, but the house was burned down literally two weeks after the murder. So the footprints were burned down and destroyed along with the house, which means that these footprints cannot be re-examined. So for this reason, the Privy Council ruled that it was just an assumption that these footprints belonged to David and that they were unable to exclude Robin as the one who made these footprints. The fourth point of contention was the time the computer in the living room was turned on. The process prosecution had argued that David murdered his mother and his three siblings before he left on his morning paper run at 5.45 a.m., that he then went out on his morning paper run got home at 6.42 a.m. and then turned the family computer on at 6.44 a.m. Experts, however, agreed that it's possible that the computer was turned on as early as 6.39 a.m. before David even got home, which means it is possible that Robin was the one who turned the computer on. Basically, they couldn't pinpoint the exact time the computer was on, whether it was 6.39, whether it was 6.44, whether it was a little later than 6.44. So because they couldn't determine the exact time the computer was turned on, the Privy Council determined that it shouldn't have been a determining factor in David's guilt. The fifth point that was raised was the time in which David got home from his morning paper run and having this exact timing helps determine when the computer was turned on. 
A woman named Denise Laney said that she had seen a man resembling David carrying a yellow bag that resembled the one that David took every day on his newspaper runs, entering the front gate of the Bain family home at 6.45 a.m. on the morning of the murders. She said that when she saw this man entering the front gate, she checked her clock in her car and it was 6.50 a.m., but she knew that that clock was ahead of time, so she believed it to be 6.45 a.m. So the police did a clock check on her car and also determined that the time that she must have seen David entering the family home was 6.45 a.m. And if she saw him entering the family home at 6.45 a.m., it was impossible for him to have been the one to turn on the family computer because the latest it was turned on was 6.44 a.m. Something this did get me thinking about was is it possible that Robin did turn on the family computer and then David got home, saw that the family computer was on and that kind of prompted him or prompted the idea of him writing this suicide note on the computer? Especially because, I mean, he wouldn't be able to perfectly replicate his father's handwriting. So maybe he saw the computer on and decided, you know, perfect opportunity to write this suicide note. Either way, timeline really matters in this case to the minute. Police did not do a time check on David's watch David says he got home at 6.42 a.m. Denise says he got home at 6.45 a.m. And the jury wasn't informed that the police did a time check of Denise's car clock. The time that David got home is also really important to this case because if David didn't turn on the computer, the only other person that could have turned the computer on would be Robin. And it would also explain the long window between when David got home and when he called emergency services. Because of the layout of the house, it is possible that the way David got home, went to his room, went straight to the laundry, went back to his room. It's possible that he didn't walk past any of his dead family members while he was walking between these places. So it really isn't strange that he didn't notice the murders as soon as he got home. For this reason, the Privy Council said that because of this new evidence that Denise's clock in her car had been time-checked, quote, might lead a reasonable jury to infer that her identification was not in doubt and her estimate of time reliable. The sixth issue that David's defense team raised was to do with the glass lens that was found on the floor of Stephen's bedroom. David was short-sighted, so he wore glasses at all times, and there was a pair of glasses found in David's room that were missing the right lens. So the prosecution argued that the lens fell out during David's struggle with Stephen. During David's initial trial, the family optometrist testified that the lens was similar to a prescription that he gave David two years prior, but that it wasn't identical. But then later, he saw a photo of Margaret wearing a matching pair of glasses. So she and David had the exact same pair of glasses. The optometrist saw this photo and remembered that Margaret actually had a really similar prescription to David. So it's possible that it was her glass lens. And the optometrist told the Privy Council that the jury in the first trial wasn't made aware that Margaret had a similar prescription. They weren't made aware that the glass lens could have been Margaret's. The seventh point that was raised was also to do with the lens and the glasses. So in David's initial trial, Detective Weir testified that the lens in Stephen's room was lying out in the open on the floor, but the prosecution argued that it was actually lying under an ice skating boot, which was under a jacket and was covered with dust. And that would mean that the lens had actually been there for some time for the dust to have collected on it. Many of David's supporters actually believe that Detective Weir actually planted the lens in the bedroom. The Privy Council did conclude that Detective Weir's testimony was misleading, but that it wasn't done intentionally. It wasn't intentionally misleading. Both the lens and the glasses, however, were tested and there was no blood, no hair, no human tissue, no fingerprints found on either. So it really shouldn't have been used as evidence against David. The eighth point of contention was to do with the bloodied fingerprints that were found on the rifle. There were five bloodied fingerprints found on the rifle and at the time of the first trial, it was assumed that the blood on the gun was human. But three years later, when they retested this blood, they actually couldn't determine if it was human or not. And they couldn't detect any human DNA at all. There was, of course, some human blood found on the rifle because it was the murder weapon after all. But the defense argued that the five bloody fingerprints that were found could have been old because David used this rifle to go hunting. He hunted rabbits, he hunted possums, and he went hunting, I believe, about a month before the murders took place. And he doesn't recall clearly 
cleaning the rifle after his last hunting trip. The ninth and final point of contention is to do with the Crown's statement that only one person could have heard Leniak gurgling and that that person would have been the murderer. The defense argued with the help of expert testimony that post-mortem gurgling is actually a thing. So the gurgling shouldn't have been used as evidence against David in the initial trial. So after considering all of this information, the Privy Council determined that there had been a substantial miscarriage of justice in this case. They sent the case back to the New Zealand courts and they suggested that a jury consider all of this evidence, particularly the nine points of contention that we just spoke about. They did, however, say that there was a chance that David was still guilty and they gave several points to back this up. The first being the spare key to the rifle lock. Did Robin even know where this was kept? There was also David's bloody theatre glove and David's blood was found on these gloves and these gloves were found in Stephen's room. David also had injuries on his forehead. He had scrapes on his knee and on his chest and his knuckles were really red after the murders, but none of these injuries could be explained. And then they also mentioned that Robin had a full bladder at the time of his murder and they believed that he probably would have gone to pee before murdering his entire family. So because of all these unanswered questions, the Privy Council believed that there should be a retrial, but that David should be kept in prison until the end of this retrial. Despite this recommendation though, the New Zealand High Court in Christchurch released David on parole on the 15th of May in 2007 into the care of Joe Karam. So by this point when he was released, he had served 13 years in prison. His retrial began in June of 2009 at the High Court of Christchurch and the prosecution stuck with their original theory that David had murdered his entire family on the morning of June 20th, 1994. But they now also had the task of proving that Robin was not the killer. They brought up David's theatre gloves and question why Robin would want to wear David's theatre gloves if he intended on ending his own life anyway. And they also question why he would want to spare David's life yet implicate him in the murders. I mean, personally, I feel like this one's a little bit obvious. Like he wanted to implicate David because they had beef before Robin died, you know? Like they fought all the time. They had this weird like fight for power sort of thing, fight to be the man of the house. So this was Robin's payback. Like he wanted to implicate him. He wanted to suffer. He wanted him to go to jail and live through the murders of his entire family. Anyway, the prosecution also brought up the fact that the handprints on the gun weren't covered in blood, which meant David was holding the gun as the killer. So the blood spatter went on top of his hands rather than directly on the gun. And then that's why the blood spatter like went elsewhere on the gun that wasn't where his hands were, if that makes sense. And then they also argued that the fingerprints on the gun had been made on the day of the murders and they had not been made on a previous hunt that David had gone on. They also mentioned his unexplained injuries and said that these were probably a result of his struggle with Stephen. The defense, however, argued that the injuries on his hands were already healing, which meant they couldn't have been made on the day of the murders. And they were likely made from doing some repairs to the house on the Saturday before the murders took place. Australian pathologists also said that apparently Robin had severe injuries on both of his hands. Robin's bladder was also brought up and the fact that it looked like it was overnight buildup. So the prosecution said that they believed that it was unlikely that he would have murdered his entire family without going to pee first, which... <laughs> can I just say is such a weird thing to have to argue, like as a lawyer going to court and be like, my client definitely did not kill them because he would have peed before he did so. So obviously he's not the murderer. I guess it makes sense. Like, I guess if you were gonna murder a bunch of people, you wouldn't do it while busting to go to the toilet. <laughs> I don't know. The defense did argue that there is medical evidence to suggest that people in high stress situations will do anything to avoid the urge to pee. They also argued that he had an enlarged prostate, which is normal for somebody of his age, and that the amount of pee in his bladder could have actually been like leftover pee from him already peeing. So he could have peed, but just not all the way. I mean, look, if your prosecution is dependent on whether or not somebody peed before murdering their entire 
entire family. It's really not the strongest of evidence, but I guess with limited evidence, you know, you take what you can get. The defense also tried to argue that the investigators and the police did not do a thorough enough collection of evidence on Robin because they were so focused on David having been the murderer. No one could determine whether or not samples had been taken from Robin's fingernails or not. And if they had been taken, they were never analyzed and then they were destroyed. I mean, there could have been tissue from Stephen under the fingernails because obviously no matter who the murderer was, there was a struggle between the murderer and Stephen. So it is likely that Stephen's DNA would have been under the fingerprints of the murderer. Blood evidence was also found on Robin's shoes and clothes, but this evidence was never presented in David's first trial. And forensic analysis also determined that there were two marks on Robin's palms, which were consistent with him having loaded a magazine into a rifle, proving that he did handle the rifle. I also mentioned earlier that Robin was right-handed, yet he was shot in the left-hand side of the head, meaning that it was improbable that he shot himself or was able to shoot himself. And this was a big part of the prosecution's argument against Robin having been the murderer. In the retrial, however, the defense brought in a firearms expert who demonstrated a bunch of different ways that Robin would have in fact been able to shoot himself in the left temple. David's defense team also did various tests where David was wearing socks that had been dipped in cow's blood to determine whether or not the bloodied footprints could belong to him. And basically, if David wearing bloodied socks could make a footprint that was 280 millimeters long, which he couldn't. His sock prints were between 306 and 312 millimeters long. None of his footprints in the bloodied socks were less than 300 millimeters. So after hearing all of this information, the jury deliberated for less than a day and they came back with a verdict of not guilty and David Bain was acquitted of all charges. And just a little side note that I thought was interesting, but this case was actually the most expensive case in New Zealand's history. So the case as a whole, cost 7 million New Zealand dollars, which is equivalent to about 4 million or just over 4 million US dollars. And the second retrial itself cost 4 million New Zealand dollars. Even after the retrial, there was so much controversy surrounding this case. I mean, for obvious reasons. In 2012, Ian Binney, who is a retired justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, advised the New Zealand government that the investigation into the murders was riddled with egregious errors and that they should give David a settlement. I mean, he was correct in saying that there were a lot of errors that kind of prevented David from being able to have a fair trial, particularly the lack of evidence in the case. I mean, you know, investigators, police, whatever, agreed to let the Bain family house be burned down literally two weeks after the murders took place. And they burned down so much evidence with it, like the footprints, for example, that could never be re-examined because the house was burnt down with the bloodied footprints inside of it. Lania's diaries and letters to her mum were also lost in the fire. And these could have been really important to examine after hearing about all of the information to do with the sexual abuse from her father. Then there's also the lens and the glasses evidence too. Obviously there was some contention about where the glasses even were, whether they were in the bedroom before the murders, under a jacket, covered in dust, or if they were just lying out on the open floor. A police photographer said that the lens was in the bedroom before Stephen's body was moved, but none of the photos or videos had any timestamps, so it couldn't be proven. Ian Binney's advice was however turned down by the government and his recommendation has been criticized for being biased toward David and it's also said that his report was incomplete as he did not consider all of the evidence. On a separate occasion, another retired judge named Ian Callanan came forward and also contradicted Ian Binney's statement, saying that he believed that David Bain likely was guilty. Eventually though, David did receive a payment of 925,000 New Zealand dollars and it was under the condition that he wouldn't take any further legal action. It was also made clear that this was not a compensation payment for a wrongful conviction, meaning meaning the government was also still skeptical about David's innocence. But the case was still not over. Shortly after the retrial, the full recording of David's emergency services call was actually released and it was pretty controversial. There was this one part in the call in particular where David was really muffled and there's a lot of contention about what he actually said. Experts tried to decipher it and there's basically two things that people believe he could have said. So some people believe that he said, 
I shot the prick, while other people believe that he said, I cannot believe it. But I'll play it for you now because I'll be really interested to see what you guys think he says in this part of the recording. <laughs> I mean, it really is just one of those things that you're never gonna know for sure. It's one of those things where you kind of could just hear what you want. Like if you think David's guilty, you might think that you hear him saying, I shot the prick. If you think it was Robin, you might think you hear him saying, I cannot believe it. I also think that like, while he doesn't seem the brightest in terms of this whole case and the way he acted towards this case. It also doesn't seem like he would be stupid enough to say on the phone, I shot the prick. I mean, we're never gonna know for sure what he said in this part. And for that reason, like that is why it wasn't deemed admissible in trial. So after David was acquitted, he went on a three month trip to Europe, which was paid for by his supporters. And then when he returned home, he got a job at an engineering firm in Auckland. He went on to marry a woman named Liz Davies in January of 2014 and she was a teacher in Christchurch and was actually the daughter of one of his supporters. A year after they got married in 2015 they had a child together and David also changed his name to William David Cullen Davies but that is everything for this case and you know despite David's acquittal there is still so much controversy around this case. The opinion on who the murderer is is really divided on whether it is David or whether it is Robin. I would really like be interested to hear your thoughts on this case, who you think, if you think it was David, if you think it was Robin. I have been wanting to do a video on this case for so long because I find the divide on this case really interesting and even the evidence, like the evidence on this case is really divided in my opinion on whether it could have been David or whether it could have been Robin. So I am really looking forward to chatting to you guys about this one and hearing what you think, who you think did it. I mean, if it was David, he did a really average job at covering his tracks. Like it was messy. So if it was him, he's lucky that the investigation was so messy as well. But if it was Robin, why would he leave David alive? And, and the note as well is what really gets this point for me. Like why would he say in his suicide note, you were the only one that deserves to say, like he's sparing him because he loves him, but then he frames him for murder. Like it just seems like such a weird note to write if you're gonna make him the fall guy. Not to mention Robin and David did not get along, like they had beef. So for Robin to say you're the only one who deserved to stay, does not make sense. They didn't even get along. The thing is that Robin really did have more motive than David. Like if the sexual abuse allegations are true, he had more motive, but it doesn't make sense why he would spare David. But then David's motive like isn't really that strong. Like they said it was a financial motive, but they didn't really delve into it all that much. They didn't really have that much of a plausible motive for David at all. I could kind of see David's motive as being over the power struggle between him and his dad. Like they were always beefing. They were always trying to one up each other. So maybe that's why he murdered him and then tried to frame his dad for the murder as well. And also, you know, frame his dad because he didn't want to be caught as the murderer. <laughs> so someone, you know, he's got to frame someone and why not his dad? Cause he doesn't like his dad. Not to mention that witnesses said that members of the family were scared of David. They were scared of the fact that he had a gun. Like Arawa literally told people at her school that David had a gun and she was scared of him and that he had been threatening to shoot members of his family. It was also his gun and he had the spare key and there's no evidence that anyone else knew where he kept the spare key. I just feel like the biggest thing for me is why would Robin keep David alive with this note? You're the only one who deserves to stay. And then he pins the whole thing on him. Like that just does not make any sense to me. Why would he keep David alive? just David. But anyway, I would love to hear your thoughts. I would love to hear what you think, who you think is responsible for the murders, but that's everything. That's everything for me today. So I will look forward to talking to you guys in the comments below and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.